uh, our next paper, uh, next presenter is Greg Monaghan. Um, uh, used to teach at Eastern Oregon University, retired a few years ago, moved to from Eastern Mo Oregon to Western Oregon, and now lives in Portland. You lucky, lucky guy. Uh, we all know uh, we all know Greg for his uh, his book on the famine of uh, 1709, Year of Sorrows. Uh, which he published in 1993, uh, and recently, uh, of course, he sort of emerges as, as the recognized expert on the Commissar uh, Revolt in 2014 with Oxford. He published Let God Arise, The War uh, and Rebellion of the Commissards. Uh, articles along the way um, with catchy titles, which I like, uh, Between Two Thieves. I think that's great. The Protestant Nobility in the War of the Commissars, which French Historical Studies published about 10 years ago. And more recently, Rebellion and Coexistence, Protestants in the Third Reign of Louis uh, XIV, which was published in a collection entitled, the, a volume entitled The Third Reign of Louis XIV, with, which uh, Rutledge published in 2017. So today, we're going to be talking about Versailles. Uh, Will the real Louis XIV please stand up? The Sun King in film and television. Greg. <clears throat> Let's call it up here, hopefully. Uh, all right. Yeah, I'm on. There we go. Okay. Well, let's begin with one of my favorite goofy scenes from a movie about Louis XIV. Spoilers ahead. The very last scene from the recent version of The Man in the Iron Mask. The prisoner in the Iron Mask was never found. It was whispered among his jailers that he received the royal pardon and was taken to the country where he lived quietly. Yes, well. <laughs> food, strike one. Three major famines and regional food shortages too numerous to count. Prosperity, strike two. Taxes were high even if they were inefficiently collected and trade was hampered by, oh yes, peace, strike three. The king was almost constantly at war, especially in the last 25 years of his reign. Man in the Iron Mask is one of the sillier movies about Louis XIV, and I have to confess that my uncontrolled giggling at the end did cause people sitting near me to wish they had sat a bit further away. <laughs> Taking its cue, I suspect, more from an old Star Trek episode than from Dumas' more intricate novel, um, it divides a king into two people, one a nasty, aggressive, selfish, sexually abusive Louis, and the other a sweet, innocent, kind-hearted, mother-loving twin named Philippe, whom his nasty brother imprisons in the titular mask. Following Dumas' novel, For Once, the film then transports the musketeers into the period and uses them to substitute the good one for the bad one. Thus, the movie has to lie about the new king's accomplishments at the end or else the whole point of the plot is lost. About the only thing either of the two kings has in common with the real Louis XIV is that both the king and Leonardo DiCaprio were fairly good-looking fellows. For nationalist French historians writing two or more generations ago, Louis XIV was indeed a hero. He was the king of uh, Bernini's uh, majestic bust, appearing to float above a cloud, the ruler who brought a rebellious and too often corrupt nobility to heel, effectively imprisoning it in the gilded cage of Versailles, the king who made France a major power, adding to its territory, who built great monuments, set the stage for fashion, sponsored the theater of Molière and Racine, the painting of Lebrun, and the operas of Lully. And earlier films about the king portrayed exactly that figure. It was particularly enshrined in Roberto Rossellini's poorly costumed, woodenly acted, slow as molasses, 1966 effort, La Prise de Pouvoir par Louis XIV, 
starring the actor Jean-Marie Pat as a rather short, somewhat rotund Louis XIV. Alas, Pat had so much trouble remembering his lines that they had to be written on cue cards so that he could read them, which he did as if he were reciting an encyclopedia article and filling out tax returns. <laughs> For all its many weaknesses, however, this film did explicitly lay out the old absolutist interpretation of the reign of Louis XIV, with scenes in which the king told Colbert he would model expensive clothing to force his nobility to bankrupt themselves, emulating him, and showing him bearing the burden of being effectively imprisoned in the Versailles cage, hemmed in by the heavy burden of a court ceremonial he erected in order to keep his once powerful nobles tamed and under control. For those enamored of that interpretation, the more recent historiography has been nothing short of a buzz kill. Starting in the mid-1980s with the books of Bill Bike, Roger Meadow, and our own Jim Collins, and continuing ever since, a far more nuanced, less hero-worshipping portrait of the king and his reign have emerged. It turns out that he collaborated with his nobility, whether at Versailles or out in the provinces, sharing power and helping to create and enhance a complex patron-client network. Some nobles chose to live at Versailles, where they had access to pensions and offices and an especially important marriage market, but the vast majority lived in the provinces where the reach of the monarchy turned out to be far more limited than we thought, hampered by a lack of resources and a host of mistakes, and especially by the king's total fixation on his own gloire, which led him to spend money he didn't have on a massive army he could barely afford in order to fight wars he could not win. It turned out that all the visual and literary propaganda about absolutism was mostly a marvelous exercise in image making that disguised a monarchy that was far less powerful than it liked to appear. So what has been the impact of this fairly large historiography on the portrait of the king and his reign in recent films? The answer is just about zero. <laughs> and as exhibit one, I give you the recent television series Versailles. Produced in France, but made in English. <laughs> So, uh, Mita, Mita, deep breaths, deep breaths. Uh, they're, they're cute, but they're right. <laughs> Produced in France, but made in English, and starring mostly British actors, with a few French and Canadians thrown in, Versailles was a rare long-form dramatization about the early period of Louis XIV. It lasted three seasons, the first two of which are available on Netflix, which will probably have the particularly goofy third season before long. Our own Charlotte Wells wrote an excellent review of the first season, which she ended with words to the wise, avoid at all costs. <laughs> Audiences did not heed her advice, alas, and it has proved popular. The first season was taken to task by critics for having too much sex. And indeed, it did sometimes seem as if the king couldn't possibly have had time to do any work because he was in the sack in every other scene, or romping with his mistresses uh, through the hall of mirrors. All by themselves, apparently. <laughs> Taking that criticism to heart, the second season turned from sex to poison, implicating just about every person at court, but especially women, in trying to poison their often deserving husbands. I won't dwell on season three, which really took flight from the historical record, except to say that it began with a scene in which no less a person than the Habsburg Emperor Leopold I showed up at Versailles in the baggage train of the king's brother, Philippe, in order to surrender his sword to a triumphant Louis XIV, which he never did, after having somehow lost the Dutch War, which he didn't lose, and was then taken on a tour of the newly completed Hall of Mirrors, which wasn't built yet. <laughs> before he seduced the French Queen Maria Theresa into a brief affair. I'll deal with the whole question of the portrayal of women later on, but suffice to say that if the real Maria Theresa had seen that last bit, she would certainly have had a stroke and died on the spot. <laughs> if after much effort one digs through all the nonsense, all the made-up stuff, all the silly portrayals of people who actually lived, including the king, um, his brother, ministers like Colbert and Louvois, and of course the women of the court, none of whom age in the series at all. What you have is a far sexier, far more confused, but essentially unchanged portrait of the king and his court from the 1966 Rossellini film. 
Indeed, the Netflix description of the series calls the palace, quote, a gilded prison for nobility. In much of season one, the king spends a lot of time not simply inviting nobles to come and live at Versailles, this even though the real king didn't move the court there to stay until 1682, after nearly all the events in the entire series have taken place, but even forcing them to come. In one case, a fictional noble named the Duc de Cassel insists on living in his own chateau and conspiring to keep other nobles from moving to Versailles. So the king engineers an attack that burns down his chateau and then forces the duke not merely to come to Versailles, but as punishment for his refusal to do it earlier, houses him in a dungeon-like attic room, bereft of just about any furniture or decoration at all. Alas, that's not all for this guy. In the second season, of course, his wife poisons him. <laughs> Not to worry, he has it coming. <laughs> Interestingly, the series spends far less time and effort on the erection of court ceremonial than the 1966 film did. The reason for that, of course, is that such scenes would be dull. And in the 21st century, even long-form television series have to move along quickly. I think that also explains why the recent historiography has had so little impact on film portrayals of Louis XIV. The old absolutist interpretation is just sexier, both literally, in the case of this series, and figuratively. The drama of luring or forcing a resistant nobility into a gilded cage is irresistible, and far more interesting than the historical portrait of a king who was a noble, liked nobles, surrounded himself with nobles, ruled through nobles. A king who held regular meetings of not one but several councils each week, who worked fairly hard one-on-one -on -one with individual ministers on a vast correspondence, even as he labored to construct an image of absolute power that did not always coincide with the reality. Here you see him dancing, as Charlotte indicated in a ballet. For filmmakers, the constructed image is the reality. The 17th century media, in essence, is the 21st century message. Except, of course, where it concerns 21st century ideas of social justice. And that brings me to one of the more fascinating aspects of recent filmmaking about historical subjects in general, and Louis XIV in particular. In January 2018, reviewing several recent films, the British publication The Guardian discussed what it called, quote, a new wave of progressive costume drama, writing that, quote, the period film has gained considerable currency as an illuminator of contemporary social issues. Historians have long pointed out, of course, that historical films are generally about the present, simply set in the past, chock full of all kinds of anachronisms. But recent historical films such as Colette, Mary Queen of Scots, and especially The Favorite, you've seen that movie, right? It's a good movie, actually. Have taken a very presentist, progressive point of view toward historical characters, especially women. Thus, in The Favorite, Queen Anne, who historically was a deeply religious Anglican, was pregnant 17 times, doted on her husband so much that she could not be torn away from his bedside when he died in 1708, becomes instead a closeted gay woman who has secret affairs with not one but two of her favorites, and her husband, who was in fact alive during most of the period covered by the film, disappears entirely. These and other films update the behavior of their female characters to make them postmodern liberated women, archetypes for a feminism that did not, of course, yet exist when they lived. In Versailles, the strength of its female characters is associated with more old-fashioned stereotypes. The women in the series are mostly sexually alluring plotters and conspirators. This is nowhere clearer than in the character of the queen, Maria Teresa. The historical Maria Teresa was a Spanish infanta married to a young Louis XIV as part of an effort to end the wars fought between France and Spain since the early 16th century. She bore the king six children, of whom only one, a son, survived to adulthood, carried herself with grace, and basically did her ceremonial and connubial job. She spoke little French, did not take much interest in court life, was very religious, and seems to have spent most of her life at her devotions, though she did like to be entertained by a bevy of dwarves. When she died of an abscess on her arm, the king famously said her death was the only trouble she had ever caused him. The Maria Teresa in the TV series is radically different. Played by the beautiful actress Elisa Lasowski, 
She mightily resents being ignored by the king, with whom she argues ferociously in public, is unsurprisingly hostile to his mistresses, whom she occasionally accosts at court, is inferred to have had an early affair with a fictional African potentates producing a mixed race baby, and later, as I indicated, has an affair with her cousin, the Emperor Leopold. Unsurprisingly, given the main themes of the series, she is inevitably poisoned in season three. In among all the nonsense, we find a far more modern woman than the queen in the historical record. A woman who does not suffer her philandering husband or his mistresses in silence, and who is independent enough to have her own affairs. Interestingly, the mistresses too, especially the most famous among them, Madame de Montespan, are also presented as independent women who did not hesitate to king the, take the king to task again in public. Of one of their more important roles, as mothers to the king's illegitimate children, the series is almost entirely silent. The historical Montauban um, bore the king seven children, several of whom were later legitimized and placed in line to the succession. But her character in the series has only one pregnancy and regards her child as a particularly irritating nuisance. To find a better example of this style of progressive costume drama, let's take a look at another film about Louis XIV, Alan Rickman's A Little Chaos, made in 2014 and featuring its director as King. Most famous for playing Professor Snape in the Harry Potter films, Rickman makes a good Louis XIV, but he is by no means the star. That role belongs to the great actress Kate Winslet, <coughs> who plays the fictional Madame Sabine de Berat, a widow who has lost her husband and her daughter in a carriage accident and makes her way as a garden designer. She is an independent thinker who claims to reject the strictly ordered geometric style of the period, but nonetheless applies to design and build one of the most famous fountains at Versailles, the ballroom fountain, for no less than the great garden architect André Le Nôtre, played in this film by the young and beautiful Matthias Schonertz, who's nuzzling up against her there in the poster. Inevitably, the two come together and have an affair. Now then, it's important to note that this film explicitly does not take itself seriously as history. The opening credit includes <laughs> a very clever disclaimer. And Rickman himself made clear in a number of interviews that he did not intend his film to be viewed as a history lesson. He pointed out that the real André Le Nôtre was in his 70s at the time the ballroom fountain was installed, and noted too that a proto-feminist character like de Berat could not have existed in 1682 when the film is set. To offer an example, let's watch a single scene from the film. De Berat has just spent some time with the ladies of the court in a lovely scene where they share their grief over deceased children and express their resentment that the king is turning away from his most famous mistress, Madame de Montespan, because she is aging and losing her looks. In this scene, de Berat uses a rose to admonish the king. That's Madame de Montespan. That's the king's brother. Wonderful Stanley Tucci. Honest son. Match. Your majesty. It is my pleasure to present Madame de Outdate awaits all roses, sire. 
roses are open to the elements, Your Majesty. They bud, bloom, and fade. Is that so? Uh... The rose grows entirely unaware, changing naturally from one state to another. And although the elements may treat her cruelly, she knows nothing of it and continues to her end without judgment on her beauty. Alas, it is not the same for us. Such a rose must be. What would she say? Yes, I am here and give service under nature's eye. And after me, my children will be. Is there any greater contribution or more graceful end? A wise rose. And what protection can the gardener afford this rose from the harsh elements of change? Patience, care, and a little warmth from the sun are our best hope, Your Majesty. <laughs> I pledge you, Madame, for that sweet reminder. Now, this scene is, first, a beautiful scene, I think. But it is a particularly good example of progressive costume drama. The real Louis XIV rarely tolerated admonishment from anyone in private, much less in public before the entire court, and certainly not from a woman of relatively low birth such as de Barat. Yet, in this very nice fantasy, Rickman's king is not only properly chastened by this brave, forward-looking woman, who does not act like others at court, but invites her to accompany him on his walk, thereby demonstrating that he embraces her bravery. What Rickman has done in this film, and this is the case with many period films of recent vintage, is effectively to backdate the women's movement that created people like de Barat and place the character in historical dress. Now, I love seeing strong female characters in films. Progressive costume dramas agree entirely with my own politics. But as an historian, I have to object when something as important as the women's movement of the mid-20th century and the remarkable and hard-won accomplishments of feminism are effectively erased by the assumption that women have always been liberated, that in effect they didn't really need those movements at all. That said, I also find myself delighted that the movement has penetrated the often stultified halls of Hollywood sufficiently to produce characters like Madame de Barat or Colette or Sarah Churchill in The Favorite. And yet, it does matter. Even if Rickman's film does not take itself seriously as history, there's every likelihood that its audience does. And that is even more the case, I fear, for a long-form series like Versailles. I have no doubt that there are many, many people out there who believe, after watching the series, that poor Madame de Montespan actually did plot to kill the king and members of the court by poisoning the communion cup for everybody <laughs> when, when she lost favor, rather than what really happened. Retiring quietly to a convent with a very healthy royal pension, where she was often visited by her many children and became renowned for the extent of her charity and good works. Likewise, there are certainly people who now believe that Queen Maria Theresa was a plotter and a schemer, who also died from being poisoned, rather than the somewhat withdrawn Spanish princess who took her job seriously, tried to do it to the best of her ability, and died of perfectly natural causes. But I know that my whining and complaining is entirely in vain. Producers and directors have always twisted history to fit the story they want to tell. We can and must keep teaching about the historical people we have researched and analyzed, and we should teach critically about the presentation of history and film. But when it comes to fighting against a series as full of nonsense as Versailles, I fear we must make our peace with the fact that we are just pissing into the wind. Thank you. <laughs>